A very good morning. Good evening to all of you. Chalo, <laughs> we are still in a Todd's palsy of the yesterday's match, uh, which was like a focal seizure. Unfortunately, with the secondary generalization, sometimes I feel the World Cup is like an event where the eleven players are going to play against each countries, and and finally when. At the end, Australia has to win, but India played very well. There's absolutely no doubt on this. Okay, so how's the Josh? How's the Josh? I believe it's high. Okay, because back home in Delhi, where I'm taking the class at home from, uh, my Josh is entirely a different one. People standing two feet apart cannot guess where are they. Okay, so as they say, India me to fog nahi, smog chal raha hai. राइट बट यूट्यूब पे पढ़ाई चल रही है दैट्स वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट सो आई एल बी डिस्कसिंग सम एमसीक्यूज विद यू विच आर सम वेर इमेज बेस्ड एंड अ क्विक रिकॉल ऑफ एवरी टॉपिक दैट यू माइट हैव कवर्ड विद अस और सम वेर एल्स स्पेशली इन न्यूरोलॉजी द सी एन एस पार्ट चलो लेट स्टार्ट ट्वेंटी सिक्स ईयर ओल्ड फीमेल हैज फ्रीक्वेंट एपिसोड ऑफ फोकल लेफ्ट हैंड शेकिंग फॉलोड बाई अ जर्नलाइज टोनिक क्लोनिक सीजर एक्टिविटी Uh, which of the following would be the likely type of seizure that we could see in the patient right the likely type of seizure is focal seizure with the secondary generalization but why as you can read it in the history he started in the left upper limb went to the left side of the face and then it progressed everywhere across the body so it was to start focally and then it becomes generalized later so that is known as the focus is with the secondary generalization correct simple right so let us quickly revise focal seizure it has been classified on the basis of the awareness if the awareness is present in my patient sorry it, if it is lost in my patient we call this as focal seizure with the impaired awareness but if the awareness is present we call them as focal seizure with the intact awareness and the third type that we saw was a focal seizure which became gtcs later on that is known as the secondary generalized right now there are two more events we should know about focal seizure patient can have one is tort's palsy and the other one is a jacksonian march we all know the word palsy means weakness or paralysis so after the seizure the limb which will develop weakness is referred as post ictal paralysis the post ictal paralysis is known as tort's palsy and what is jacksonian march this will happen in a patient wherein the seizure would start in the limb distally go proximally or the other way around so the onset of seizure is distal or it may go proximal or may proximal go distal in that way is referred as a jacksonian march right uh, just let's quickly revise other topics also what is absence seizure in a patient with absent seizure we have a loss of contact with the environment which is very typically sudden in onset and very short in duration in most of the patient it is for a duration of less than 30 seconds and with the loss of consciousness that you see in the patient they will always give you a kind of a stare look or a blank look and how to diagnose them is to do the eeg wherein you will find these kind of patterns that will start on hyperventilation and this pattern we already know is known as the spike and wave or the spike and dome pattern on the eeg and don't forget the drug of choice for absence seizure is always what ethoxamide then a short topic again known as the juvenile myoclonic epilepsy it's seen in juvenile people most of the time it seems to have a juvenile onset but it has many seizure type one type that you can see in this image is typically a myoclonus a jerky movement in which anything in the hand will drop down easily but why many a seizure type 
because we found that if they are left untreated, majority patients of JME will develop a seizure type which is referred as GTCS and one third of them would also develop another seizure type that we know as the absent seizure the absent seizure and don't forget the drug of choice for juvenile myoclonic epilepsy is always always the valproate okay for absent seizure why not valproate sir <laughs> i know in the guidebooks they do write valproic acid as a preferred regimen but still in the higher books of neurology in everywhere ethosuximide is a preferred therapy and then we have our friend gtcs with us who comes in three phases the pre-ictal phase the ictal phase and the post-ictal in the ictal phase as you can see in this image there are few phases that you can see the first phase where the patient would be moving in a tonic posturing is known as a tonic phase then it would be a clonic phase and then finally we have a post-ictal phase wherein the patient lows, lays down flaccid the post-ictal phase wherein the patient develops a lot of facidity okay so the flaccid phase is a post-ictal phase the movement phase is a clonic phase the jerky phase is the clonic phase and, and a kind of a tonic posturing that they have is known as a tonic phase and don't forget for the GDCS again the drug of choice is the valproic acid okay now let's read this question and find an answer which of the following is incorrect about the patient with refractory epilepsy whose MRI is shown in the image as you can see there is something very small and bright over here so there is something shiny bright over here and small small means atrophic and bright means sign of hyper intense tell me what part of the brain are we seeing over here and what is the likely cause or the disorder that we are expecting in this patient Okay. I hope I'm audible and visible. Sorry for the interruption. So uh, we all can see this as a case of temporal lobe epilepsy. It's very, very clear in the image. So what is temporal lobe epilepsy? Uh, it's a mesial temporal lobe epilepsy as the complete name stands for. In our patient, we'll have focal seizure with the impaired awareness. Impaired awareness. Okay. Right. Secondly, in our patient, we'll always have a temporal lesion that is seen on the medial aspect and most of the time the temporal lesion that we see in them is hippocampal sclerosis. Is a hippocampal sclerosis. If it is an hippocampal sclerosis that they will have, the temporal lobe will ideally look very small. They're going to have a small temporal lobe. Temporal lobe. Surgery is the best treatment, treatment of choice that we consider for temporal lobe epilepsy any moment. And we're going to do the resection of the temporal lobe, the medial part. And we know the surgery is known as the temporal lobectomy. The temporal lobectomy. Now, since the lesion is somewhere located on the medial aspect of the temporal lobe, they are going to have certain olfactory hallucinations. So olfactory aura can be seen in the patient with temporal lobe epilepsy. Okay. 
So let's find the answer for this. Which of the following is incorrect? There is a post-rectal phase with amnesia. Yes, that is confusional state that will follow any kind of a focal seizure with impaired awareness. During the phase of impaired awareness, they usually have got amnesia with them. Simple. Impaired consciousness with strange sensation or hallucinations. Yes, that is a kind of a aura that they have, olfactory aura most of the time. Dissages arise from the temporal lobe. Yes, on the EEG, that's very, very correct. But do they have generalized tonic-clonic seizure activity with themselves? No, that's not seen in them. They don't have a GTCS. They usually have a focus seizure with the impaired awareness. Okay. So which of the following is a correct drug in the vacant box used in the management of status epilepticus? The first drug that we start is either lorazepam or midazolam. And the drug of choice I always remember is lorazepam. Then the second priority should be to give an anti-epileptic drug, any one of them, phenytoin, post-phenytoin, valproate or levetiracetam. And if the seizure is persisting beyond half an hour in my patient, I will go in for a therapy which is slightly sedative like midazolam and propofol, either of the two. Then if the seizure is there beyond 48 hours, if the seizure is seen in my patient beyond 48 hours, then then in that case, yes. What are you going to give? Thiopentone. Thiopentone. So what is a missing link in the entire uh, management protocol for status epilepticus? Is finally the thiopentone that we give at the end. If the seizure is lasting beyond 48 hours. So that's a correct statement and a correct thing. Okay. The following teratogenic effect can occur due to which of the following drug used in pregnancy. What is this teratogenic effect that we are going to give or we are going to see in the patient? This is a cleft lip. Cleft lip, cleft palate is seen in which of the following use of anti-epileptic during pregnancy. None other than phenytoin. Because phenytoin comes with what? A fetal hydatoin syndrome a fetal hydatoin syndrome easy talking interesting topic easy to remember and a cool topic to remember just like our the liver of cricket that we missed msd we have in our patients small brain size microencephaly as a phenotype we usually have got shorter limbs and they come across with certain defects that we find in them over the lip and the palate. So this is what we define as a fetal hydatoin syndrome that we will see with a cleft lip seen in the patient. So a quick recap about pregnancy and epilepsy. The seizure frequency in around 50% of females during pregnancy, if I'm if they are pregnant and epileptic, is remaining same or unchanged. In approximately 30% of them, I would see an increase in the seizure frequency. While in 20% of them, there will be a paradoxical decrease also seen. Can you tell me one hormone that will actually increase the seizure threshold and decrease the seizure frequency? One hormone in females present, which is responsible for decreasing the seizure frequency. Second thing that we should always remember if the patient is on an anti-epileptic drug, continue only one drug, monotherapy. Most important thing. If you want to give, give it only one. If you want to start, start only one. And already if on an anti-epileptic drug, please continue the therapy. Please continue the anti-epileptic drug. Okay. The hormone that will increase or rather decrease the seizure frequency by increasing the seizure threshold is progesterone or estrogen. P for protection, P for progesterone. It will actually increase the seizure threshold and decrease the seizure frequency. Okay. Good. Right. Let's see the next question. The patient following presents with a large amplitude coriform movement in this left arm as shown in the image. What is it? 
as you can see the patient is having a large amplitude movement which is looking to me more like a flinging movement such a flinging movement that you see any time is nothing other than your hemibalismus hemibalismus seen on one side of the body and hemibalismus if it is seen in the patient on the left side the lesion has to be there in the opposite or the contralateral subthalamic nucleus so if i have this problem on the left side the right subthalamic nucleus is the site of the lesion that you can expect in the patient okay so quick recap on the movement disorder one is balismus that we've already seen second one is ethitosis it's a typical movement that i see as what a crawling movement and to create this trouble the lesion is located in the basal ganglia in which structure globus pallidus globus pallidus and what is this this is typical chorea that you can see over here okay semi purposeful dance like movement right and chorea we all know happens due to lesion in which structure in the brain the caudate nucleus the caudate nucleus right let's move ahead the following tremor is most likely to occur in which of the following condition observe the tremor clearly in last day image the hand is shaking but when i try to hold it a glass it actually is not there so this defines a tremor which is at rest but not on doing any activity yes the resting tremor that we know the resting tremor and we all know the resting tremor occur in which of the following condition parkinson parkinsonism right so quick recap again we see tremors which are intentional on reaching the target they start happening this is usually seen in cerebellar lesions cerebellar lesions okay then we have flapping tremor like this like the bird wings of the bird are flapping this is usually seen in encephalopathy encephalopathy and then finally we have the fine tremors which occur in patients of thyrotoxicosis thyrotoxicosis right the following pattern of rigidity is seen in tell me what kind of rigidity are we seeing this we are trying to extend the patient's arm or arm sorry at the elbow and then we find the patient is having a jerky movement like the wheels are moving in a machine which are having spikes and spokes at the edges the typical cogwheel rigidity the cogwheel rigidity cogwheel rigidity is seen in parkinsonism right so in wilson's disease which kind of tremor is seen good question wilson disease is hepatolenticular degeneration we'll have copper deposits everywhere and we'll have it in the liver causing cirrhosis cirrhosis will complicate it as what hepatic encephalopathy so wilson's wala patient is more likely to have flapping tremor because of encephalopathy okay okay so let's quickly revise rigidity patterns also we have a lead pipe rigidity which is same constant throughout the range of motion this is seen in typically extra pyramidal lesions extra pyramidal lesions then we have the cogwheel rigidity that is seen in parkinson and then we have the class knife also known as spasticity this is seen in the pyramidal lesions pyramidal lesions okay right just a quick recap of the clinical features someone was telling me the mnemonic trap we have tremors in patients of parkinson if you remember the type of tremor that we have already written is a resting tremor rigidity yes we also get that in a pattern in the upper limb especially the cogwheel and they have a slowed movement 
while walking and while working known as bradykinesia okay okay which of the following symptoms seen in parkinson is depicted in the image this is a normal spiral and this is the spiral made by a patient of parkinson as you can see the normal spiral the every line is separated at a good distance but this spiral looks very very small and it's too congested like this this represents nothing but micrographia a progressive small handwriting that they will write with yes micrographia so a quick recap of the other clinical symptoms that we find other motor symptoms that we define in parkinson we have in our patient a small handwriting progressive micrographia a speech which is very very soft just like mat cholega don't worry i'm not scaring you this is a very soft voice or a whispering voice quality that they will talk with the monotonous speech and a face that doesn't change the expression it looks the same as if i have faced a kind of an expressionless face an expressionless face okay mask like face and this patient as you can see in this image slightly is bending to one side is unable to hold his posture very well that maybe i can ask tell you about what is known as postural instability he is unable to hold his postures very well like this he is just falling here and there while walking changing direction postural instability okay <clears throat> okay now tell me this facial appearance that you saw this time the patient is having a look like this like yesterday's match there were a lot of faces i could see initially they were happy faces optimistic faces by the end it was mask like face and in between when the wickets were taken and the drs was applied every bowler every batsman every audience had this kind of a face a lot of wrinkles on the face as you can see on the patient's face is typically a surprise look right okay surprise look on the face no this is not the mask like please this is a surprise look you look at these wrinkles on the forehead region if the wrinkles appear on my forehead possibly i'm giving you a kind of surprise look yeah this is seen in which for the following condition oh sorry you can just change option a it missed out from my end my apologies it's psp that's so why you are wondering what is the correct answer <laughs> psp progressive supranuclear palsy yes someone has typed the correct answer okay what is psp you can see the patient is walking standing in an extended posture not a stoop posture he seems to have a defected downward gaze cells so while walking they don't look down they will have an history of fall very very often and they will have a dystonia on the forehead region creating a typical surprise look on the face with lot of wrinkles okay so mask like face is seen in parkinson wrinkled appearance on the forehead with a surprise look is seen in psp and what is the favorite topic of the neat examiner dementia of lewy body yes so parkinson patient coming with dementia which comes in his life in a duration of less than 1 year of onset and of course visual hallucinations sitting in a toilet they can see people around them that's a kind of a visual hallucination okay multiple system atrophy we all know patient of parkinson having some cerebellar symptoms like ataxia broad base gait and a lot of autonomic symptoms like orthostatic hypotension or something a parkinson patient having cerebellar symptom is msac parkinson patient having autonomic symptoms is msa a okay so that's multiple system atrophy
someone is asking me what is the difference between PSP S form and R form oh god if I see there are two patients of PSP that we found one was PSP P form one was PSP R the R form is known as the Richardson form so what we saw as a symptom in a triad above is steel Richardson syndrome it's a Richardson type well PSP P wala patient will have symptoms just like a patient of Parkinson's disease and a initial response initial response to levodopa also but later on they will progress themselves to the R form so there were some patients of PSP which we found initially presented like Parkinson and had a good response to levodopa and then the response stopped in them and they started having an extended posture, surprise look on the face, everything. So the one which started with a good response to levodopa therapy is a PSP P form. Okay. Yes, the MSA A. MSA A is also known by an older term known as Shy Dragger syndrome. Okay. See, don't spam in the chat box mechanism of action of valproic acid. You should know the right person to ask such questions. <laughs> Pharma people. Okay. Okay, about the Romberg sign, we'll come to that also. I've got a question on that also. Now, what is this area? Damage in the area marked in the image would result in which of the following deficit seen? Yes, what area is this? This is the area number 9, 10 and 11. The legendary prefrontal area. Prefrontal area helps you in two things. One, control of emotions and second is retrieval of memory. So maybe the control on emotions is totally being lost over here. And because of that, my patient seems to have an antisocial personality or a changes. Okay. So a quick recap about frontal lobe. Yeah, it has got the legendary motor area. Maybe this image from the physiology book will explain it better. It's a kind of a homunculus in which the hand, the face relatively have got a larger representation in the brain than the other parts. Because we all know one thing clearly, the finer the skill, the finer the skill, the larger the area of representation that we generally get. Second important area that you could find over here is a Broca's area for the word formation. And then the third prefrontal area to control your emotion and anger anything. Okay. Now damage in the area marked in the image would result in which of the following deficit in the patient. So look at this image. This I see is a sulcus present in between known as my friend central sulcus behind in the central sulcus we have an area number one two and three the primary sensory area behind this we have the five and seven this is the sensory association area sensory association area is helping for, for me for stereognosis graphesthesia and two point discrimination so now a stereognosis will be a symptom seen over here okay so quick recap on parietal lobe also it is having a very important area the sensory area yes in which the representation is almost the same like the motor homunculus and they come to me with the parietal lesions come to me with a optic visual field effect that we know as pi on the floor If there is a damage in the optic radiation in the parietal loop, you will have a pie on the floor. Taste area is also there. And the most important is angular gyrus. The left angular gyrus is more or less for learning. And the right angular gyrus is for visual spatial orientation. So the left angular gyrus is lost. The words that you are reading, you are not able to understand. You will just read and write these words upside down or left to right. This somewhere an image representing the famous... Jospin syndrome. The right angular garris, don't forget, 
will have an hemispatial neglect as a trauma. Okay. Right. Then a patient with aphasia has an impaired comprehension or spoken words, impaired reputation, preserved naming, and a fluent speech. So comprehension, naming, reputation, and fluent speech. Okay. So in my patient, the patient has got an impaired comprehension for spoken words, impaired reputation. The naming is preserved and fluent speech is there. Where is the lesion likely located in the circuit? The circuit depicts your auditory visual input into the vernicase through the arcuate fibers into the broadcast to give you a speech output. So first of all, you should know what kind of aphasia is it? Can someone of you tell me what kind of aphasia is it? It's nothing but your friend pure word deafness. Pure word deafness, yes. In which the lesion somewhere lies over here between the auditory and the vernicase area. Right? If we have the word PWD, this is the pure word deafness. So some of the people are answering me transcortical aphasias or above. Vernicase aphasia, yes. Comprehension is lost, naming is lost, repetition is lost. And fluency increases a lot. Brokaz on the other spectrum. Yes. Fluency is decreased. Repetition lost, naming lost, and comprehension is well intact. And in all the kind of transcortical aphasia that you find, sensory or motor, there is going to be one thing preserved in them repetition. So remember the transcortical sensory is just like one case with a preserved repetition. Okay, the naming is present, the fluency is normal. Oh sorry, the naming is gone. The transcortical motor is like Broca's where the fluency is decreased, the naming is lost and the comprehension is well intact. Okay, so it's a very clear thing that we should know. What is C? This part which we saw was a arcuate fiber. The arcuate fibers. If you have a damage in the arcuate fibers, you'll end up having what? Conduction aphasia. So there's another aphasia that is known as conduction aphasia, in which the patient's naming and reputation is gone. Comprehension is intact, fluency is well maintained. Okay. So, this is what we know and we see as various kinds of aphasias, the basic aphasias that we know. Chalo, let's move ahead. Falling reflex is seen in infarction of which of the falling artery? What reflex are we checking? It's a primitive reflex known as what? The glabular tap. Glabular tap is a primitive reflex, but it requires inhibition as you grow up. And the inhibition for this comes from which area in the brain? The frontal lobe. The supplementary motor area located in the frontal lobe. Frontal lobe. Right, and this area is supplied by which artery? Anterior cellular artery, AC. Chalo, let's see this now. AC infarction. In our patient, there will be low limb weakness with urinary incontinence because the paracentral lobule that you know, the medial most part of the AC is supplied of the brain is supplied by the AC. So they are supplying the lower limb and controlling the bladder socially. Resurgence of primitive reflexes will also occur. And the prefrontal area, 
which is basically controlling your emotion is also lost creating in your patient a violent and an antisocial behavior right so simple straightforward question antisocial behavior is a symptom or a behavioral abnormality is pathognomic due to infarction of which of the following artery that is ac right yeah someone recall the meyerson sign this glabular type is seen in which of the following other conditions apart from ac infarction we have documented the glabular type in a patient of parkinson and if it is seen in a patient of parkinson it is also referred as a sign as the meyerson sign the meyerson sign okay Hmm. Now comes a legendary clock. Apna time aega. What is this clock? Half clock. All the numbers written on the circumference. That you know as a hemispatial neglect. Hemispatial neglect. This is a symptom which occurs due to lesion in the right angular gyrus. We've already written this thing. And this right angular gyrus is supplied by which of the following artery? Middle cerebral artery. So right MC infarction is going to create this trouble. Okay. So quick recap on the right and the left MC. The right MC patients are going to have a hemispatial neglect, but are they going to have aphasia? No. Aphasia occurs whenever the lesion is on the left because the dominant speech areas are located there, not on the right side. And of course, what else? They're going to have weakness. Hemiparesis, hemi anesthesia. Okay, right. And what is the simple thing that we'll see in the left in MC infarction? We're going to have aphasia. We're going to have the Gerstmann syndrome due to involvement of the left angular gyrus, and the same word hemi, hemiparesis, hemi anesthesia. Okay, so just remember a simple rule, left MC infarction, Gerstmann, right MC infarction, hemispatial neglect, left MC infarction, aphasia, right wala, no aphasia. Okay. Hmm. Visual defect shown in the image is due to infarction of which of the following artery? Ah, heminopia, but sparing someone what macula so it is heminopia with macular sparing that you can see in this image clear image and this occurs due to occipital lobe infarction and that is being supplied by which artery pc posterior civil artery right simple so let's have a quick recap on this PC infarction, we're going to have blindness. That is heminopia with macular sparing. Due to involvement of hippocampus, we're going to have amnesia also. And we're going to have a symptom that is shown in this. One in Chinese, one in Russian. If someone graduated from Russia, or the Russian segment, they know what is written over here. And maybe some people have graduated from China also, they also can read it very well. But now most of the Indians cannot read it. They are blind to these words. This is known as pure word blindness. Just like Alexa at your home. She is blind to words. You talk to her to communicate with her. Pure word blindness. Okay. All the best is written in Chinese and Russian over here. Okay. Right. A patient presents with hemianesthesia followed by paresthesia. As per the image, the lesion is likely located in which of the following structure? Tell me. A patient suffered a stroke, maybe just to elaborate it, had hemianesthesia followed by paresthesia on recovery. Yes, this is nothing but your Jirain Rousey, DRS. We'll read that topic now. And this occurs due to lesion where? In my friend D. What is this structure D? Thalamus. 
what is the structure a a chordate nucleus what is structure b the outer peripheral part of the lentiform the putamen what is the structure c that is nothing but your globus pallidus right right so what is drs jarain rausi syndrome patient has got anesthesia followed by a deep agonizing pain on the same side paresthesia all due to pc infarction and a thalamic lesion and this thalamic lesion is more likely located in the lateral nucleus the lateral nucleus of thalamus is the site of the problem in these patients okay hmm what is this i am waiting for your answers now which of the following symptom is seen in the following image that you have seen over here okay which of the following symptom is seen in the image can you tell me you are seeing that image in your mind or your brain And and this is nothing but uh, and you persistently see that image. Okay. Yes, this is nothing but your palynopsia as a symptom. Persistence of the image in the brain is seen in a palynopsia. It may be seen in balance, no doubt, but it's seen in antems very well. here will patient will have a partial blindness they will have some tiny islands of vision they're going to have certain tiny islands of vision they will be unaware of the blindness for one reason whatever they see they see it for a longer time they've got persistence of the image in the brain some of the authors have written this as a kind of visual hallucinosis also that means what they see slightly they see it for a longer time that is known as palynopsia i agree with that fact that it can be seen in balance also balance syndrome but it's seen in antems very well okay now what is balance let me let me share this topic with you now a patient has been asked to circle the a's in this image but he circled only the small a's his symptom is likely to be seen in which of the following syndrome yes the balance syndrome what is balance syndrome is simultogonosia the point here is that in this image what alphabet are you seeing tell me and in last the image what alphabet are you seeing over here finally the output are you seeing t or are you seeing h is yes, someone is seeing c also acha uh, that's, that's option i thought dyslexia is there this is h out of a lot of t's that we have tried to make patient cannot integrate all the t's together is known as simultogonosia some people are seeing only t are baba can i last what has happened to your ah t and h that's smart answer okay okay so apraxia oculomotor in which they cannot take their eyeball to a longer distance and locate something kept over there and ataxia of course a visual ataxia in which the patient cannot reach a visual target okay so that's a simple balance syndrome topic that we know i agree with harrison they have written that palynopsia can be seen in balance it is seen in antens both but i personally feel in antens it's perfectly seen there okay yeah so what is the moral of the story at this image don't look at only one player look at every player in every match they should play well then only we'll achieve the target okay right so for you the moral of the story is that don't focus only on one subject 
every subject is equally important try to integrate them simultaneously otherwise you will have a simultognosia for all the questions that you see over there and to explain simultognosia in a better way this is the correct question 65 year old male patient with no past history of diabetes and hypertension awakens from sleep at 8 am finds that he could not move his right upper and lower limb and he is also having slurring of speech by 9 am he is brought into the nearest hospital and this is the ct image that we know what is the ct image showing you infarct okay infarction we are seeing over here Possibly it's an MCA territory in fact, it's very obvious in the image. Okay, this part. Right. Oh, so 8 a.m. the patient got up. He awakens with a neurological deficit as per the timeline. Okay. By 9 a.m. he is into the hospital. And this is the CT image that we have seen. Okay, what is the ideal treatment that we like to offer him? Yeah, we all have seen Drisham. Yes, we all do see Drisham. Like in the next sequel of Drisham, George Kuti or maybe Vijay Salgaonkar will tell his family member on Sunday we did not go for a cricket match, we watch football, tell everyone that. <laughs> Why are they so happy? Okay. Now the point is that Drishya movie had a crux line. You know, every scene is deceptive. So the point here is that if you don't see Drishya uh, Hindi version, let me remind you, 2 October, 3rd October. Bolo Zuba Kesri. Okay. Anyway, so uh, the Drishya movie had a tagline, every scene is deceptive. You think that the onset is just one hour away? No. Remember the onset for a stroke to happen in a patient who has stroke is basically written as last seen normal. So a patient who woke up at 8 a.m. in the morning with a neurological deficit, he was last seen normal when? When he went off to sleep. So the point here is that, you know, you can sleep for more than 4.5 hours, of course. Okay. So the stroke happened in, in him during sleep. So that 4.5 hours, the window period that we keep in for recombinant TPA. Whenever you read recombinant TPA, think it as IV, intravenous, by default. Okay. So, my dear friend, you have passed away for 4.5 hours. Aspirin is the correct answer. Some of you gave, give us this correct answer. Heparin and warfarin are your anticoagulant. So, what is the treatment guidelines for acute ischemic stroke, thrombolysis, intravenous and intraarterial both? Intravenous thrombolysis to be given to the patient if they come within 4.5 hours of onset. Intra-arterial thrombolysis is given to the patient if they are having a large vessel occlusion or maybe the deficit is still there after thrombolysis and the infarct size that you saw in the patient is too small. As per the latest guidelines, we go like this. For a large vessel occlusion, we give it up till 6 hours from the onset. For the infarct and the deficit mismatch, we keep it for 24 hours from the onset. Most of the patients for preventing the stroke further, we give them aspirin. An anticoagulation like heparin and warfarin are generally given to the patient if they are having atrial fibrillation or maybe in the background they have a rheumatic heart disease or an artificial wall with them, the prosthetic wall. So what are the indications for thrombolysis? We have already done this window period. IV thrombolysis, don't forget the window period is up till 4.5 hours from the onset. For the large vessel occlusion, it is up till 6 hours from the onset now. And for a deficit more than the infarct, even after thrombolysis, it is up till 24 hours from the onset. Okay. Okay. The following is the most likely site of lesion in the following CT image. This is a site which is known as the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia bleed that you can see over here. Right, correct. So let's have a quick recap. What are the sites of the bleed that we generally have? 
so intracerebral hemorrhage whenever you have the most common cause that you realize is what hypertension for a putamen bleed it can be present over here in the outer peripheral part of the lentiform nucleus that you can see over here and this time the patient presents with contralateral weakness or hemiparesis thalamic bleed that you can see in the image will come to me with contralateral sensory loss or hemi anesthesia and then finally we have the cerebellar bleed wherein the patient will have ataxia most of the time and the more dangerous is a pontine bleed where the patient will have pinpoint pupil quadriparesis and hyper hyper thermia hyper hydrosis hyper maybe respiratory rate tachypnea and hyper heart rate tachycardia that's a pontine bleed site okay right the most common cause of the disorder in the following ct images tell me what is this seen in the ct image okay someone wants an explanation on question number 12 oh my god i'll come to it later on 12 has already gone back a lot ah what is this a subarachnoid hemorrhage sh and the most common cause for the sh is trauma 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 kya likh rahe ho sh ka most common cause trauma are berry aneurysm kya ho gaya tum logo ko what has happened are trauma i know has happened yesterday for most of the indians but doesn't change, change my answer the most common cause of sh is trauma the most common cause of spontaneous sh non traumatic sh is berry aneurysm rupture please come out of the trauma <laughs> okay etiology again i'll repeat i don't know why are you etiology again i'll repeat i don't know why are you answering berry aneurysm most common cause of sh is trauma most common cause of spontaneous or the non traumatic sh is berinism rupture and one another cause that we look in for is at the interaction again okay so we have treatment available for a patient with the uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage one treatment that we know is surgical in the surgical treatment that we can see that happens in my patient is one is coiling and the second one that we find is a clipping either of the two can be good for the patient okay and don't forget a calcium channel blocker that we like to add into the patient nemodipine this is a drug which is going to inhibit known as the vasospasm the real villain that we see in the patient and then we have the triple h therapy the 3h therapy in which we like to make our patient's bp go on the higher side hypertension with a higher volume load hypervolemia given through the iv fluids which is going to dilute the blood very well in them known as hemodilution so this is the triple h therapy that we can see okay so I repeat everything again don't worry 
So going start from the causes, etiology of SAH, the most common cause is trauma. The second most common cause is spontaneous SAH, non-traumatic is perineum rupture. Clinical feature is a thunderclap headache with neck rigidity and loss of consciousness. We do have a delayed deficit due to re-rupture, the most common cause of mortality, vasospasm, most common cause of morbidity, and a hydrocephalus, a dilated ventricle. Investigations will show me on a CT scan a subarachnoid hemorrhage and an angiography a aneurysm. Surgical treatment, clipping and coiling, nemodipin is a medical treatment and the cutoff of BP, someone is asking me that it's 160 by 90. Okay. Right. We keep it on the higher side. Don't take it above that. Otherwise, we'll have re-rupture. Right. The following test is used for the diagnosis of which of the following disorder. What test are we doing? The ice pack test. And the legendary ice pack test that we do is useful for diagnosing which of the following disorder. Mycenia gravis. Mycenia gravis. A so quick recap on mycenia again. We got ocular symptom, we got facial symptom, and we got skeletal symptom. In the ocular symptom, we'll have ptosis and ophthalmoplegia, and that seems to be the most common symptom seen in them. Then the facial appearance of the patient will give me a facial appearance of a vertical smile. The vertical smile on the face that you could possibly see would be like this. The person giving me a snailing or a snarling appearance. The snarling appearance on the face. And then finally the skeletal. We will have easy fatigability as a symptom. Screening test that we know in the patient of uh, Parkinson, oh sorry, Myasthenia gravis is the eye spec test that we have done. And the specific test for diagnosis of myasthenia is the acetyl choline receptor antibodies. And of course, the sensitive test for diagnosing of myasthenia is always a single fiber EMG, SF EMG. Okay. Then, then we let's look at the treatment part. We give to a patient a style choline esterase inhibitor that we have as the pyridostigmin. And of course, the immunosuppression is required for them. And a removal of the factory for the antibodies, an organ located in the superior mediastinum, retrosternal, a thymus, thymectomy. Okay. So that's a quick recap. Okay, the following gross brain specimen depicts which of the following disorder? Tell me. Hmm. This is a gross specimen showing the brain atrophied with a wider, deeper sulci and of course the prominent gyri. This depicts a brain of Alzheimer's disease. So quick recap on amyloidosis. Alzheimer is a process with which there is a change in the structure of protein, amyloidosis which causes a trophy in the brain and loss of memory or the amnesia. On the biopsy that we could see in the patient, neurofibrate angles are seen in the brain with tau proteins and senileuritic plaque. And symptoms that we can explain in patients of my, uh, Alzheimer disease is of course the amnesia. The type of amnesia that we can see in them is an anterior grade amnesia most of the time initially within aphasia that is anomic aphasia and inability to do the skillful task known as the apraxia okay alcoholic male presents with urinary incontinence abnormal gait for the last three months he is also complaining of loss of memory so he's having a gait ataxia he's having urinary incontinence he's having dementia he's a good guy who is this good guy? Gait attacks a urinary incontinence, dementia, normal pressure, hydrocephalus. A quick recap on this topic as well. Here my patient will have a gait ataxia, will have urinary incontinence and loss of memory, dementia. And what are the other symptoms? Huntington chorea, autosomal dominant disease due to Huntington gene where the patient develops chorea and dementia. And what is this MRI showing you? Image. What kind of ventricle? A car with a box inside to carry coals in the mines. The box car ventricle. 
on the MRI seen in patients of Huntington Korea. One case in cephalopathy. Yes, the legendary Goa tried global confusion, ophthalmoplegia, and ataxia that could be seen in the patient. Okay, which of the following disorder will have this brain biopsy changes? What is this brain biopsy? This is a sponge where the brain has been replaced by some microscopic vacuoles and it looks like a sponge. Yes, this pattern of degeneration in the brain is referred as the spongiform degeneration. Where does it occur? This is seen in patients of prion or the CGD. Okay, so CGD, a quick recap. These patients are going to have myoclonus. This is the most common symptom seen in them. And it is typically seen as a startle myoclonus. The moment I touch the patient, the patient jumps like in this image. They've got a degeneration in the brain, the spongiform degeneration. And the MRI shows what? Hyper intensity is like ribbons placed inside the brain. The cortical, the ribboning. Okay. Right, 20 year old obese female presents with progressive hectic and decreased vision. Her CT scan is normal while her funder shows the following changes. Which of the following is a likely cause for her symptoms? Young obese female presenting to you with a progressive headache with a decreased vision. And what is this image showing you? Optic disc coming up. Yes. Yes, optic disc coming up. What is this? Papilledema. Yes, very good. CT scan is normal. There is no tumor. There is no focal deficit. This is nothing but your friend's urotumor cerebri. A quick recap again. The patient has got headache, papilledema, and of course, no focal deficit. It's a young obese female most of the time. The causes most common type is idiopathic. It can be iatrogenic also. For example, with the use of excess of vitamin A, hypervitaminosis A, this can be a cause for this. And the major reason behind this is the decrease in CSF absorption. A simple easy topic to remember, pseudotumor cerebri. The following signs are used in diagnosis of which are the following disorder. What are these two signs? Yes, we bend the knee knee earnings and this is we bring the neck the Brudinsky they are the signs of meningeal irritation most likely due to infections and they are seen positive in conditions known as pyogenic meningitis in them so let's quickly revise pyogenic meningitis what are the clinical features they come to us with fever headache and neck rigidity the sign which we find positive is this one is a Koenig's again and this one is a Rudinsky. What is the CSF analysis showing you? A cell count which is high, pleocytosis. Most of the time more neutrophilic than lymphocytic. Protein again is high and the glucose is very very low. And looking at the CSF picture being kept in a test tube, it's looking like a pus. It's a turbid looking CSF that you can see over here. Right. Right. Ah, now comes an EPG question. The following CSS specimen is likely seen in which of the following condition. We find something as a sediment depositing there. Hmm. This is a typical orb of appearance that you can see. This was the neat PG image and this is nothing but a patient of tubercular meningitis or the TBA. So tubercular meningitis, how does it present? It presents with the basal exudates, a big ring enhancing lesion tuberculoma or maybe in fact in the brain also. CSF analysis, the cell count is high but most of the time it's lymphocytic than the neutrophilic picture. Protein again very very high and the glucose on a slightly lower side, not very very low, like a pyogenic picture. Okay. Hmm. 
Hmm. Now this is interesting. The color is slightly different. It's not turbid, neither cobweb. It's dark yellow. Now Sangmala Jomala Maite nahi. Tell me something which I don't know. A yellow looking CSF. Yes. That is Xanthochromia. Xanthochromia. Are milega PDF milega on eMedicos app. Don't worry. Feel happy. Anna. See these images right now with me. I'm explaining them very well. So there should not be any problem later on if such images come in the exam. Yeah, that is seen in HSV encephalitis. Great. Okay. So fever is there, altered sensorium is there, and they present with seizure also. A triad. CSF analysis shows me a cell count which is more lymphocytic than the neutrophilic. Protein on the slightly higher side and the glucose which relatively remains normal in them. And this picture, don't forget, is a darker looking CSF that is your HSV encephalitis. Okay. 45 year old man recently moved from Delhi. Oh my God. He suffers a focal seizure followed by secondary generalization. He denies any symptoms of active infection. Neither has he recently suffered with any trauma or any other infection. His neurological examination is normal and this is the MRI shown. A typical ring enhancing lesion with a significant edema that explains the focus is with the secondary generalization. So what are we going to give? Antiepileptic with steroids followed by albendazole because I think so it is a case of neurocysty sarcosis. Never give albendazole initially. It will break the cyst. It will increase the cerebral edema. Preceded always with what? Yes, preceded always with what? Always with a steroid because steroids are going to basically kill down or prevent the further edema that would happen after the albendazole therapy. Look at the other options. Loxamide, if you don't know, is an anti-epileptic drug. Vancomycin and cefepime, we all know, are the antibiotics. They are to be given in patients of brain abscess. Brain abscess comes as a sequelae of infections like CSOM or maybe some neurosurgery or maybe head injury or trauma. In this patient, there is no head injury, there is no concomitant infection happening, so don't think about brain abscess. Acyclovir is given for HSV encephalitis which will come not with such a ring enhancing, they come with a hyper intense temporal lesion most of the time. Okay. So the best answer and the correct answer is this. So one thing remember about NCC, if you want to diagnose it radiologically, you should locate one part of the parasite very well, Scolex. Scolex should be recorded inside the MRI. If the Scolex is seen, it is a case of NCC. If it is not seen, please correlate clinically. Someone asked me later on, sir, can you see the scolex over here? No, I cannot see scolex, but I can see my Delhi. Delhi is unfortunately an endemic zone for NCC that we still believe. Yeah. Because we don't eat pig and neither it is a Kantara movie. The only thing that comes to us, Tinea solium, is through the uncooked raw vegetables, which have just been steamed and put inside the dish of Delhi. Can someone tell me what is the dish of Delhi? Every state has the dish, no? Mumbai has got Vada Pao. Uh, Gujaratis have got Dhokla. Indorans have got the uh, Poha. In South, there are so many dishes. Every state. Ah, momos. We eat more momos than China could even produce. Or even Tibet. So in momos, the chopped vegetables are uncooked raw sometimes. And we end up getting all these cabbage and all these vegetables from the momos and we end up having uh, NCC so frequently in Delhi. Yeah, so many varieties of momos available in Delhi. One day China will attack us for this only. Give back our momos. Right. Which type of MS is depicted in this image? It's a two relapses followed by progression. It's known as secondary progressive MS, SPMS. Correct? So multiple sclerosis, a quick recap. 
presents with optic neuritis, visual loss, unilateral, some weakness in sensory symptoms. If you look at the MS types, it's relapsing type, it's progressive type, or it is initially relapses later progressive. You can very well diagnose them on the MRI also by looking at these images of demandination and scarring, which is seen perpendicular to the ventricles as if someone has put his finger into the brain. These fingers are known as the Dawson fingers. CSF shows me what? The oligoclonal band. And there are certain evoked potential that are required for diagnosis of optoneuritis, like the visually evoked potential of the web. Right. Treatment for the acute attack, don't forget steroid. But for the disease modification and preventing relapses, the drug of choice is interferon beta. But the best drug to control maybe the number of relapses in a patient of MS is always the enetalizumab. And don't forget the younger brother, NMO, neural myelitis optica. It's slightly different from MS for two reasons. One is the optic neuritis seen in them is usually bilateral. And they've got one symptom to define them better, transverse myelitis, which is involving in them three or more than three segments. A lot of hell, lot of neurological symptoms, which can be cerebral, which can be brainstem even. Okay. Okay. So quick recap of myelopathic images. Yes. Look at this image. First image on the left. The spinothalamic is impaired in my patient. Posterior column is safe. Possibly due to a cavity sitting in the interior part of the this. Yes, this is what is known as a cape-like distribution of sensory loss. This is seen in which condition? Syringomyelia. Syringomyelia. And what is this? Spinothalamic is impaired, the posterior column is intact. It is an anterior spinal artery occlusion. ASA. Because anterior spinal artery, if I know, is supplying the interior two-third of the spinal cord. And the posterior column is impaired, the interior spinothalamic is spared. This basically depicts a posterior column disorder, the tabis dorsalis. Right? And the spinothalamic and posterior column, everything is gone. All across the spinal cord, everything is gone is a transverse myelitis. The spinothalamic is impaired, the posterior column is safe. The spinothalamic is impaired on this side. Posterior column is impaired on this side. Hemisection of the spinal cord. Don't forget the topic, Mr. Brown. The Zair Wali Kheer for you in the exams. The Brown Sequat Syndrome. The Brown Sequat Syndrome. Right. And this. One side of the face, one side of the body has been anesthetized half, cross hemianesthesia that typically occurs in Wallenberg syndrome. Wallenberg syndrome. And this is nothing but your thalamic lesion, hemianesthesia. Thalamic lesions. Right? Hmm. Need PG question. Patient presents with a family history of ataxia, reflexia, and a foot deformity like this. What is this foot deformity? High ash foot, pes cavus. Which of the following vitamin deficiency is most likely to be seen in the patient? <coughs> what are we talking about finally in the question? We are talking about the legendary topic, Frederick ataxia in which my patient has a family history of ataxia, areflexia and an extensive plantar. And someone was asking me about the Romberg test. We do it with eyes closed and the patient starts swaying and falls with eyes closed. This is known as a Romberg test. This is seen positive in generally in conditions where there is a posterior column lesion. 
They also have corticospinal involvement causing an extensive plantar. They've got areflexia. And the reason for areflexia in them is involvement of the DRG, the dorsal root ganglia. That is a first order neuron to take an impulse to the spinal cord. And what is this? They also got a bended spine with them known as kypho scoliosis. Correct? So this is nothing but a patient of Frederick ataxia who comes to me with a vitamin E deficiency. Hmm. Oops, sorry. Right. And that was the last ball of my match. You are feeling still match or lumba on a chieta. Sir should have taught this, that, so many topics. It's an image-based discussion, only important topics I could take out for you. It was scheduled to be a one hour session I took slightly longer. Got see the breaks that we have. And people appearing for FMG and need PG. This is a meme that I've got for you. Objects look in the mirror more closer than they appear to be. Okay, so see you very soon in DVT. Okay. See you very soon in DVT. Also see you very soon in the DFX for the MCI people, the FMG candidates. And we are holding a special session somewhere in uh, uh, Calcutta also for the revision program. So people who are non-Demsonians, uh, if they are somewhere in the northeastern side or the eastern belt, uh, they can attend the session in Calcutta se se uh, uh, center. Somewhere in the last week of December we'll have it. It will be just medicine, six days of medicine and entire thing will be done. And this kind of triad logy and all that, you know, it's just a glimpse of what we have for you in the DVT, DFX and uh, maybe the special revision programs that we're going to hold at some centers. Okay. Prosopagnosia occurs due to inferior temporal oblesion. As per the higher textbook, it's a very clear statement there. PDF, we'll get it in the eMedicos app. We'll update you about that. TBM, tubicular meningitis treatment protocol is simple. You give ATT for one, uh, sorry, 12 to 18 months and steroids for two months. Okay. So any other genuine doubts you got with you, apart from the PDF that you always want, Yeah, boxcar ventricle is in patients of Huntington's chorea, not in NPH. Okay. So boxcar ventricle is seen in Huntington's chorea patient. Hello, a very, very good night to all of you and uh, see you soon at various uh, centers and uh, see you very soon at the dvt also Chalo. Okay, D cerebrate decorticate rigidity lesion, sir. Okay, just remember one thing there is a red nucleus. If the lesion is above the red nucleus, you'll have a decorticate rigidity. If the lesion is at or below the red nucleus, you'll always have a D cerebrate rigidity. In decorticate, the upper limb is flexed, the lower limb seems extended. While in D cerebrate, everything is extended. It all depends on the red nucleus lesion. The red nucleus and above decorticate, red nucleus and below is decerebrate. Okay. Chalo, ciao, and uh, a lot of things are to be done from your end. So, most important is the triad of read, revise, and a good recall. So, revision is a key 
that you need to do practice practice as many mcqs and try to complete the topics which you are weaker in first and of course good at you can do it later on and try to solve mcqs also side by side and keep on revising your notes because finally in the exam uh, we are not going to repeat the questions anywhere we will not see repeated questions there we often see repeated topics okay yeah left angular garris apraxia or right angular garris dressing apraxia see uh, first of all apraxia as a concept is a very diffuse thing it can be constructional it can be dressing it can be ideational ideomotor uh, dressing apraxia construction apraxia they occur in right angular garris lesion left angular garris typically comes with a dyslexic problem like the justman syndrome okay चलो बाय